Um, so I'm Helen Kim, and I'm a perinatal and reproductive psychiatrist, and I work, work over at Hedman Healthcare System at Hedman County Medical Center in our mother baby program um, and our new Ready Center for Family Healing. And it's my distinct um, pleasure today to moderate today's session on structural racism and health. And I um, I'm just really big fans of our three speakers, so I'm just excited. I'm going to give them the floor, but I just wanted to start us off um, just with an observation I had from our mother baby work. So we see pregnant and postpartum mothers with depression, anxiety, and mostly uh, trauma um, related conditions, often from historical and generational trauma. Half of our moms are uh, publicly insured on medical assistance, and half of them are pri privately insured with commercial insurance. And it never, um, it just is. Uh, a, heart, a, a very co continuous um, reminder when I see these mixed groups of moms from very different backgrounds, how so much of their struggle is structurally determined, social determinants of health. That it's not mental illness that drives their distress, it's often these structurally determined, social determinants of health that affect not only them, but their whole social support system. So I think the topic today is incredibly important, um, and I'll just uh, and here with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Our first speaker today is Dr. Rachel Hardiman, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Health Policy and Management here at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Um, she is passionate about moving the conversation forward around racism in, in public health, and to that end, her goal is to contribute to the body of knowledge that enriches how we understand the ways that institutions and systems um, can dismantle uh, systemic racism. Dr. Rachel Hart. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to keep my uh, remarks short because I'm hoping to have a discussion and a dialogue with everyone. I think, uh, you know, taking an opportunity to have um, a discussion about a topic that's often uncomfortable to talk about and painful to talk about, um, particularly for those in the room, our core engaged in public health work and um, healthcare delivery is really important. And so um, with that, I will share a few slides and then um, pass it off to my colleagues before we, um, we jump into a, a hopefully important uh, conversation. So I'm going to start 400 years ago because I think it's important um, to understand our past in order to understand our present and certainly to reshape our future. Um, this year marks the 400th anniversary of the pivotal event that has shaped our country, and that's the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first slave ship to America. In 1619, over 20 Africans were sold into bondage in Jamestown, Virginia. And as you can see from the timeline on this slide, um, so black enslavement comprises 60% of our country's history, and then 22% is made up of Jim Crow laws or 20, yeah, 22% is made up of Jim Crow laws. So while we might argue over how different America might have been had our country never embraced white supremacy and race-based slavery, we certainly cannot argue that this history has not fundamentally shaped who we are today. And I would argue it has fundamentally shaped how we deliver healthcare, how we do public health, how we train our students, and every other aspect of health and well-being in our country. Understanding our history means exploring the origins of racist ideas and understanding that race was socially constructed to support racist ideas and discriminatory actions. Has anyone read Sam from the Beginning? So in, in, in even Kennedy's book, Sam from the Beginning, he suggests that discriminatory actions brought by self-interest come first. Then racist ideas are developed to justify them, and then they spread. So in other words, racist beliefs were created to prop up the institution of slavery and justify the poor treatment of black Eventually, the rationale for black oppression multiplied in the colonial era and the slave, early slave holding republic. The idea that African slaves were party, political party, are made for work, couldn't feel pain, had thicker skin, all were constructed to justify slavery. And it's important to recognize that these ideas persist today. In just 2016, a study was done at the University of Virginia among medical students and residents where they found that the researchers found the same beliefs persisted among those interning at that medical school. They also found that students who were more likely to endorse those beliefs also had a score higher on the implicit racial bias test. So we're here today to talk about the issue of structural racism. And I think it's important to understand 
the impact or the role of structural racism within the context of public health through the social determinants of health. I think we as um, public health professionals have gotten really comfortable talking about the social determinants of health and the fact that where we live, work, play, um, worship matters for our health, but we have not done as good of a job of understanding why those determinants matter for health. And I would argue that that's because of structural racism. So my program of research has contributed to building the evidence base that structural racism is a fundamental cause of racial and ethnic health inequities in our country. So when we go around the phrase, for example, that zip code matters for health, um, we need to be clear that the reason zip code is a determinant of health is because of a string of racist policies aimed at creating and perpetuating racial, racial inequities through his, a history of things like racial covenants. So the tools used by real estate uh, developers in the 19th and 20th century to prevent people of color from buying or occupying property in certain areas. And this was followed by a policy of redlining and ultimately with residential segregation. And even today in 2019, we see where these boundaries are drawn and it continues to dictate where certain racial groups live, where they get to go to school. And increasingly studies are showing that residential segregation is associated with poor birth outcomes and other health outcomes. So while the focus of my work has been on structural racism's impact on black communities, I think it's important to understand and recognize what the mothers in these two photos have in common. And that is that they are both at least four times, if not more, more likely to die during and in the year following childbirth. So both this American Indian mother and her baby and this African American mother and her baby um, are more likely to experience death. They also share the experience of being the most historically marginalized, persecuted, and erased cultures in America. It's not a coincidence that birthing people and babies from these communities are suffering disproportionately. Maternal mortality and infant mortality are important markers for the public's health, and inequities in maternal and infant mortality are certainly rooted in racism. Current inequities in infant mortality and maternal mortality are inextricably linked to the years 16, 19, and those in between. While infant death rates overall have declined since the 19th century, the disparity between black and white infant deaths today is actually greater than it was under antebellum slavery. Historical demographers estimate that in 1850, enslaved infants died before one year of age at a rate of 1.6 times higher than that of white infants. So 340 versus 217 deaths per 1,000 live births. In comparison, the CDC figures from 2016 show that today, non-Hispanic black infant mortality is 2.3 times higher than mortality among non-Hispanic white babies, meaning that's 11.4 deaths and 4.9 deaths respectively. In addition, although black women live longer lives now than before, the effect of racism has reverberated in their lives and those of their children in damaging and in fatal ways. Since 1994, maternal mortality has dropped by almost 50% worldwide, yet between 2000 and 2013, high black maternal death rates placed the United States second worst in maternal mortality among the 31 OECD uh, nations, so among all of the industrialized countries in our, in our world. The U.S. is one of only 13 countries in the world where more women die in childbirth today than they did 25 years ago. And African-American women, regardless of their income, regardless of their education, or any other factor that we as public health professionals tend to believe as protective or think of as protective, is immune to this problem. So I want to close, um, so my, my, my role here was really to kind of set the stage for I think an important critical discussion on what our role is as public health professionals, as researchers, as clinicians, and dismantling the systems of repression that have for so long um, caused poor health um, and well-being among communities of color. You'll have a chance to hear from my colleagues on the panel today about what they're doing in their own organizations in the Department of Health and at North Point, a federal, federally qualified healthcare center. Um, I would like to leave you with the um, idea that this work takes time, and it takes intention, and it takes a willingness to both dis dismantle and the political will to reconstruct. I truly believe that the systems that are currently in place um, are, are actually functioning the way they were designed, and they were never designed to ensure that black and brown people were healthy. And so the next steps and the next the next phase of this work has to really be to dismantle those systems and build new ones that are serving everyone in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
so thank you also for setting the frame of our conversation. So our, our hope today is that we'll have uh, these 10 minute um, convers or introductions to different topics and that we'll have lots of time for um, hearing from you about what you're doing in your own settings and uh, questions you have and ways we can participate in um, dismantling structural racism. Our next speaker is going to give us the lens or the view from the Minnesota Department of Health. This is Bruce Tao. He is the director of the NPH Center for Health Equity. Bruce leads across multiple sectors in his work to advance equity and social change. He has over 15 years of experience working with diverse communities, including immigrants, refugees, people of color, and LGBTQ communities. He's worked across many sectors, government, philanthropy, nonprofit management, and academia. He's a Bush fellow and a wonderful person. So. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. You had you had lunch. You had coffee. Okay, you're gonna stay with us this afternoon. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the introduction and uh, Dr. Hartman for setting up the context for today. Um, so I'm here to share some of the work that we've been doing at the Department of Health. We've been on this journey of really digging into understanding structural racism. Uh, and health equity and racial equity and what it means for us as a state agency to lead from these lenses. And we've been working on this for about almost 10 years now. And it really began with um, Commissioner uh, Dr. Ed Ellinger, who was our commissioner with uh, Covering Dayton, and the, his leadership team. And it's been a uh, really incredible journey over those years as we transition into uh, Dr. Waltz. And so I'll share some of the things that we've been doing internally uh, to change the, the way that we do business as a state agency. So before I go in, I, I'm showing you this screenshot. This is a screenshot, not doctored, not photoshopped. When you Google healthy people, this is the first uh, Google images that pop up. So just shout out and tell me what you see. Okay, white people, what else? Young people. They may already be healthy. They may already be healthy, yeah, what else? They equates fitness with health. Fitness equates with health, skinny. Women, then <laughs> fresh veggies. Yeah. So if we think of Google and the Google sphere as representative of the dominant narrative or the mainstream narrative in American society, then when we think of healthy people, we would and we would imagine that the dominant narrative is that healthy people are happy white people eating salad. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. I love a good salad and I love white people. Some, some white people. Uh, but then the question becomes, why is this the dominant narrative? And with that, with that famous headline, we've all seen that Minnesota is one of the healthiest states. Minnesota becomes one of the healthiest states for a home. Right? And so this question of the narrative is something that the agency has been exploring and thinking about for several years now. And there are two seminal reports that we put out, that we put out many reports with health equity as a brand, but two really stand out. Uh, the first is the 2014 Advancing Health Equity Report. Uh, just raise your hand if you've read that before. Great, uh, many, many of you. Um, they, they're trying to cut me off. Okay, <laughs> trying to take my mic. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If I need to switch, just hurry up. Um, so I remember when this report came out because I was still uh, in the nonprofit world and I was a director of health and wellness for a local nonprofit organization. And the day this report came out, I read that the key finding they had was that structural racism was the greatest barrier to health equity for folks in Minnesota. And it completely resonated with what I was seeing in my communities every single day. And so that was a huge um, moment for the agency. And that report continues to have ripple effects nationwide. The next report um, that I want to highlight is our 2017 statewide health assessment. And these are reports that state agencies have to put out every five years for accreditation. And this time, rather than another report that would sit on a shelf where you can say, These are, this is how bad the disparities are. We already know that the disparities have existed for decades and centuries, but this time we ask the question of, why do these persist, and what is our role in, as individuals or as institutions in perpetuating the inequities? And so we use this frame of opportunities for health, our interactions with nature and our health, and whether people have a sense of belonging or not, and how that impacts their health. 
and all the data is packaged under that frame. So I want to highlight that as a resource as well. That's been really powerful to help us create a new narrative when we're talking about health and equity. So the center, the Center for Health Equity was created in 2013. We, we continue to be the Office of Minority Multicultural Health, and we have been for decades. And the center was created as an umbrella group that the Office of Minority Health came under. And we have um, defined this mission for ourselves to connect, strengthen, and amplify health equity efforts in the state. Um, just, this is just from about two or three years ago. And these three critical roles um, we see ourselves playing within the agency, we're a consultant to the agency, helping to provide um, strengthening and amplification work for health equity and to connect people, and we do this in the community. So one of the things that we did um, a couple years ago was created this frame. And so this tree is our framework for when we are working and going into community. These are, in order to achieve that mission in our trunk, we're rooted in these core values in the roots of the tree which are, that will honor cultural knowledge and wisdom, that we continually foster trust and belonging, and that this is something we have to do over and over with communities. We can't say, 2000, 2010, we went to Bemidji, we worked in the American Indian community, trust is built for the next 20 years. It doesn't work like that. So some folks in government may think that is the case. <laughs> Listening deeply, which means that we will go into communities and listen first before we say uh, what we think they should do. And then recognizing that health equity is a human right. Now the tree branches are our approaches to the work, and so when we reach out and engage communities, these are the these are the approaches we will hold to, which is naming resilience, intersectionality, network leadership, that everyone is a leader, you don't have to be <coughs> at the top of a, a pyramid to be a leader, racial equity, community-driven data and decisions, and lastly, creating systems that heal rather than harm. So what would it mean if we could, with community, imagine not just dismantling systems, but creating co-creating and dreaming up systems that actually work for us, that heal us rather than oppress us. What would that mean and what would that look like? And so uh, um, we're going through these really quickly just so we can have some talking points to get your feedback on. Um, I believe the slides are shared and so I have links to all the different pieces I've talked about on our website, um, our handouts that go deeper into the tree and the things I've talked about. The last thing I want to highlight is our current strategic plan which is uh, ending this month. And this is what has guided our health equity work over the last five years. There's a link to our work plan and on some of our metrics that we've used to track this. Um, but these six strategies are really integral for us to say, it's not enough for us to track data and then put out data and say, these are the inequities, but we also, as an agency, have a responsibility to look at how we may be perpetuating um, oppression, systemic racism, institutional racism. And so these six strategies were all have goals and metrics within those that we implemented over the last five years just to begin this work. And we are still have a lot of work to do, but I also want to recognize that we've done a lot internally to get us to where we are today. So building in the internal capacity is about um, the trainings that we do. We required uh, a four-hour racial equity training uh, for all staff, so our office trained about 1,600 staff across eight offices across the, street, the state on, on racial equity and multiple other, we have a menu of trainings that we offer. Addressing barriers to working differently is about helping people to have the skills to be creative in how they do the work. Changing systems that perpetuate inequities and structural racism is about looking at the internal policies, procedures, and standards that may be perpetuating inequities uh, or maybe barriers to communities really truly engaging with us. Um, goes into the fourth one, authentic community engagement and training our staff on how to do this with community and not tokenize communities. For improving data, these are things like working towards having data guidance and standards for disaggregated data, for race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, gender identity, for disability, uh, and trying to track those and make those consistent across the agency. And also that there are data feedback loops. So it's not that we are collecting data on STD rates in a community and then putting it out there without that community being able to own the data and say, this is what's really happening in the community. Uh, and the last piece around communicating our commitment to equity is both about communicating out what we're doing and also being accountable to communities so that there is a roadmap and then community can say, you said you were going to do X, Y, and Z. How have you delivered on what you were going to say? So <clears throat> that's a, a bulk of the work we've been doing. There's multiple programs and strategies within that that I'm happy to share uh, share more and talk about uh, as we move forward. Thank you. And our closer here. 
<laughs> That's right. Is uh, Stella Whitney West. She's a giant in our community, and we're so blessed to have her um, here. And she's been doing this work for so, so long, and I just, um, we're on the shoulders of giants, and you are one of them. Thank you. She is the CEO of North Point Health and Wellness Center. Do people know about North Point? It's an awesome place. I, I work in Huntington Healthcare, and we're deep admirers of the work at North Point. They get it done in a way that it takes us much longer. So um, North Point is a federally qualified health center. Um, again, Stella is the CEO, and North Point serves over 25,000 residents in North Minneapolis with comprehensive medical, dental, and behavioral health care. Um, Stella has decades of experience working with governance and policy boards and nonprofits. She has extensive senior management experience in the different cities. She um, serves our community in so many ways, uh, visible and invisible. So thank you so much. And you're, I'm saying, our closer because you're going to help us center on community, which is, I think, the heart of the heart of the heart of our work. It's centering specifically on families, children, and on communities. So thank you. Thank you. each other here is like she's been working a lot with a lot of my staff a lot of the motivating program and actually uh, she helped us um, adopt that adapted for african-american um, mothers and babies as well and uh, just recently so i just found that, that one of our um, partners at Hennepin county um, she kind of caught that person and now they're going to be working for her and she was like apologizing and i said no need to apologize we're all friends here we just like, anytime somebody moves over we're just like hey we got a pipeline <laughs> now, so we're really happy about that and another thing i just want to think is it chris who's back there christopher because i was kind of afraid because we said we were going to do 10 minutes and i was like where's my timekeeper and i can't be looking at my body and i saw chris waiting. so what when it's Two, that means you got two minutes left? <laughs> That'll work. That'll work. That'll work. So I'm so happy uh, to be here, so happy to, to see all of you here, um, my colleagues here. We said we were only going to spend 10 minutes up here, and then we really want to have a dialogue and a conversation with you. I think they both set the table. Um, this is uh, difficult, but it is necessary. I mean, we. What we are seeing and living right now, I mean, every morning, I say, don't watch the news, don't watch the news. Click, I'm watching the news. Mm -hmm. Okay. What year is this? <laughs> no. Hmm. Food stamps, cut. What year is this? Hmm. Problems. However, one of the things that uh, we believe, and Dr. Kim already said it, is that, and it's one of the taglines that we have at, at North Point, is that health happens in healthy communities. We know that uh, as awesome as our clinic is, and no matter how many patients or residents that come into the clinic, we figured out a long time ago that we need to be outside of the four walls, that we need to be in the community because that is where our patients and clients were making decisions about health. That was what was impacting them and their health was in the community. So we really, believe that our work is in the community. Make sure I get this part. So um, Dr. Hardiman gave a definition of structural racism. This is one that, that I like and I want to make sure um, that you get it. So structural racism, a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. And this came from the Aspen Institute. And one of the um, key partners that North Point has, that we're considered a public entity at QHC, is Hennepin County. We have a partnership with Hennepin County, and I like to tell people uh, our role in that partnership is to show Hennepin County how you engage with the community, how you engage with your uh, constituents differently. Not to show up all the time as an 8,000 pound gorilla, but how do you truly show up as a partner? We know, because we've been partnering with Kennedy County for a while, that when you talk about institutional racism, that 8,000 pound gorilla 
is the reason why it's 8,000 pounds is because of the institutional racism. The um, graph that you see there is one that I first saw about a month ago, and it almost brought me to tears because what it shows on um, the far right, and I'm just going to point out for the, the juvenile um, system, on the far right, it shows the number of juveniles that are in Hennepin County in the population. And then the next graph shows how many in the racial percentages are actually incarcerated in the juvenile system. So for African Americans, which is the orange bar, there are 22% African Americans represent 22% of the youth, but they are 70% of the youth that are incarcerated in Hennepin County. That can only have occurred because of institutional structural racism. African American youth are not inherently bad. African American youth are not just prone to commit all kinds of things that would get them into the juvenile and not at 70%. That is just outrageous. So North Point, some of you, how many of you know us as Pilot City? Oh, okay, a few. How many of you know how we came into being? Okay, 1968, there was a rebellion. Some people call it a riot. We said it was a rebellion. The community, again, we are rooted in the community. The community rebelled against the structural racism that in their community that there was a lack of jobs, economic opportunity, there was a lack of access to health, and we felt that in it. Those of you who are old enough to remember that time period in the mid 60s know that it was a general uh, climate of unrest across the country. So on Plymouth Avenue, where North Point is still housed, um, there was a rebellion. And as the outcome of that rebellion, citizens came together with um, community government to submit a grant to the federal government for, uh, this was in the, the Johnson administration, the War on Poverty, and in fact, that they were funding these multi-service uh, community centers or centers. And so, uh, North Minneapolis submitted, and they were funded, and that's how Pilot City, because it started off as a pilot, came into being. So I always like to tell that to say that we grew out of that rebellion. We have always been rebelling against structural racism. <laughs> I think Dr. Kim talked about the fact that as an FQHC, uh, we have um, medical, dental, mental health services, and actually we have a, a nonprofit. Uh, as an FQHC, we are governed by a community board, and I think that that is why it makes us so powerful. In fact, I report to that community board, and so if 51% of our board members have to be patients, what other health facility, the institution has that type of makeup where the patients are in charge, right? Things are done differently when the patients in the community is in charge. And when the CEO, I make it real clear to him in the county and to anybody else who I report to and who is my boss. It's not them. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, over 96% of our patients are clients are people of color. Boy, I had two minutes. And 99% of the people are low income, uninsured. So, because we're focused on the future, future trends in healthcare, many of these uh, trends we are actually embracing at North Point. So, value based care, you all should know about this. That is moving care from just accounting, people get paid just because you show up to, no, you get paid because you actually have some positive outcomes. You actually got people healthy. Uh, population, health management, looking at a particular population and how you are responsible for the health. Uh, and then this is one that I'm really excited about, Genom genomics. Did I say it right for all the people in here? <laughs> Based precision medicine and predictive analytical care protocols. It's a mouthful, but what it means, folks, is that looking at your DNA, looking at how that impacts uh, your health, and more importantly, how we develop treatment and protocols, medicines for that. They're doing a lot of that with cancer. One of the things that we have seen through research 
is that when people are exposed to trauma, racial discrimination, and racism, it does change the DNA makeup. They're starting to see that and starting to be able to recognize it. And that's just how important, particularly when you're talking about babies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move through this really quickly because I only have a few minutes left. How to use futurism to save the world, to change what you do today, to make tomorrow better. Um, Tristan Harris. Anybody know Tristan Harris? She is now a futurist. I love her. She has got to start to think about the future. One of the things, and she has a book, I'm giving a plug, How Future Good, because she wanted to make sure that nonprofits and social service organizations were involved. Uh oh, Chris is telling me to wrap it up. Were involved in the future. And so one of the things that she talked about in her book, and I just think that we've been guilty of that, where we spend too much time admiring the problem. Right? She talked about where she was doing a presentation and she had the typical PowerPoint that showed all the disparities. And there was a woman in the audience, a very uh, famous woman, that said, aren't you embarrassed? And these were the disparities in Minnesota. And she was like, oh. And she said, yeah. She said, so what are you doing about it? And she said, she never showed those slides again. So it's more about, <laughs> we need to stop admiring the problem. We know it, but what are we going to do about it, right? Okay, I'm flipping through this really quickly because this, I think, is probably the most important takeaway. Our relationship with Hennepin County, when you talk about institutional racism, the 8,000 pound gorilla, the history of government and race, right? Some of this, I don't think is history. Some of it is happening and never really went away, but it's more visible now. Initially, right, it was very explicit. There were laws on the books for racism, discrimination, and then it became implicit, right? You couldn't really, you know, discriminate, but it was happening. It was race neutral. And I don't think we can't afford to look at race neutral policies, right? Race neutral is not going to get us where we need to be. And then now, government, Hennepin County, certainly in partnership with us, is starting to look at more proactive policies, it's starting to look at practices and procedures on how they can advance racial equity. In fact, Hennepin County has a disparities uh, reduction plan. I tried to fight for, why are we calling it disparities reduction? Why not call it equity? Because I said, what level of disparities reduction is acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the only acceptable goal is equity, but I was outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> However, it is a plan, and what I like about it is that it is addressing, as we call the social determinants of health, but I also call them the political determinants of health, because many of these are determined by policies, by politics. So we say social determinants and political uh, determinants. I also would say that Hennepin County has made an investment in North Point in North Minneapolis, first time ever, $67 million. Um, we're in phase three. If you come by the corner of Penn and Cormac, you'll see the difference. We are expanding, building a much larger um, clinic. But also, I want to call your attention to the historic election in 2018. First time in the county's 166 year history that they had two commissioners of color, both women. I was blown away. And a openly gay sheriff that was elected. That to me was all I needed to see. Because I tell you, when you got, and I tell many of my friends this, because I have to go in front of those commissioners all the time. There are seven county commissioners before 20, 2018 election. They were all white. They control, if you live in Hennepin County or any place you know, housing, roads, uh, health. They're in every aspect of your life. Two billion dollar county government. And there are seven, seven people who make those decisions. We used to say count the votes. So, 
is kind of like, hmm, who am I going to get that is going to come on board? Now I know that the odds have just gotten better for communities of color when we count those votes. Thank you.
for the movement because if there's like documents that need a signature and she is worried that something might down the road come back to me, she's like, I sign it. You're not putting your name on that. So it's about that level of commitment um, for for the movement for justice and equity. Yeah. So I'm Diane Marksteiner, I'm the head of genealogy and community health, and I wanted to say something professionally and personally. So if you have, this is a big issue in our division of how to do a better job of addressing diversity and inclusion, and many students come to me um, to say good things and to complain or give ideas for improvement, and I, I, I welcome those. But I wanted to share something personal. I have four children, three boys, one girl, and I raised them all through adolescence, and one of them he had um, a few run-ins with the police. And I often thought that if he had been black, he would not have gotten that second chance and that third chance. And that was all he needed. And I think those are the stories we need to be telling, because you know, you get the 70%, and we hear that, but what are the white stories that, that where, where kids were given a second chance and a third chance? And they turned out OK, and that's, so it just breaks my heart that, that other people aren't getting those chances, and that is what structural racism is. So thank you for your work. I, I was going to say that one of the things that, that we're doing also with North Point is, is working with the police. So actually, the 4th Precinct is right down the street from us. We have a, uh, a clinic, a satellite clinic, that is on uh, Broadway. In Lindale, uh, in North Minneapolis, that has a high uh, drug trafficking, has high um, crime, um, prostitution, uh, and we made uh, the decision. And there's also um, a church, a uh, sanctuary church, that is next to it. A church that has a strong mission focused on um, North Minneapolis as well, and, and working with the community. Uh, so we made a decision that we were going to pull all the partners together and to address the issue because many of our patients and some of our staff were having difficulty. So we um, also, that means uh, that we met with the police. And so they said, one of the things they're going to do is they're going to be adding additional police officers. And they're going to be uh, patrolling. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for this inspector because one of the things that he said, he said, I just want you to know that this is not going to be um, business as usual. We are not going to be um, just stopping everybody. Um, this is not going to be, uh, what was the program in New York? The, stop this is not stopping for us. And he said to us, we want you, I want you to report to me if any of my officers are harassing your staff or your patients, or anybody in the community. I want to hear that, because that is what we, that's not what we're here for. And we told them, thank you. And we also said, we're going to provide the outreach. We're going to connect people, because of the root cause as to why people are in prostitution and drug use. We're going to connect them with the resources that they need in order to turn their life around. And that is starting to happen now. So we. Police departments, police, another major institution. I always say that we can do much better working with them than just standing out and throwing stones at them because we have to be involved in order to transform those institutions. We got one over here first. Uh, hi, I'm Grace Tooney, I'm on the faculty here in the School of Public Health. Thank you all. Uh, <coughs> I appreciate it, um, the information you've been sharing with us today. Uh, I, uh, one of my courses, I have students reading one of the health department reports, which I, uh, when I read it, and I still think this, I think it was really great, because it defined a lot of things in a way that was um, very accessible to a lot of people. But when I had a discussion in my classroom, one of the students said, all the data, I'm so tired of all the data at the individual level. And so I know what happens is that you know we use you know surveys and surveillance, and so it points out the inequities. But what it does then is make the solutions focus on the individuals. We have to fix those individuals. 
And so I appreciate it because I'm a policy person. Um, and I, I think it would be really great if the health department and other institutions can collect systematic data on the, on, on the policies and on some of those issues. Because then it would lead us to the solutions to solve the, the problem and not try to just fix the people. And I'm curious what all of you think about that. Um, I, I can start, and um, I, I, I see um, a, a wide spectrum at the Department of Health. Um, there are some um, divisions and programs that really get upstream work and really um, are doing an incredible job of connecting um, the symptoms that we're seeing at the individual level with the systematic level of contributors to that. And then there are some areas that um, really need support in moving upstream. Um, and I would say one of the ways that we've tried to do that in our area is um, we have a, our Eliminating Health Disparities Initiative grants, our UGI grants. Um, and in this latest RP, we put out a frame for decades that has been um, primarily focused on in direct level, direct service work, uh, which is still a huge need. Uh, and so we didn't want to stop funding that because many funders are stopping funding that because they're funding policy systems, environmental change. Um, but we're trying to help provide a, a, what we call levels of change. So we said, you can do any of these three. You can do level one, direct service, prevention and intervention work. Level two, look at your institution and how you can change your institution systems or policies to promote change or school systems uh, or county level systems. Or you can look at level three, um, social determinants or conditions for health and how you move upstream. So I, I would say that we're starting to get there, but I agree that we still have a lot of work to do. So, um, I just add that, you know, I think, Dr. Uh, you're right, that the population level um, analyses is important and necessary. That's a, a lot of the work I do with the Minnesota Population Center, understanding, using census data, for instance, to understand what's happening in neighborhoods and at the census tract level, and um, really getting a sense of sort of, um, you know, who's getting home or denied a home mortgage, um, you know, across various census, tra census tracts. And, um, you know, we've even looked at sort of police presence um, in, in certain neighborhoods and are actually seeing that even just having a higher, a disproportionate amount of police presence in a neighborhood is harmful for health. Um, so I think those, those, that type of data does lend itself to um, thinking more on the big, you know, that capital P, the big P policy level. Um, but I also, I, I feel like we know a lot of the answers to these, you know, to these questions. A lot of the research I do, I feel like, um, it's certainly part of my life experience, and I know the answer. I know what is happening in the lives of you know the, my family members and the people in my community. And you know, we part of the problem then is that there's a lack of political will, right, to to enact change. So I mean, there's nothing that makes sense or that could convince me that um, we need to cut this answer. Right? That doesn't even make any sense. But yeah, here we are, right, having this discussion. So you know. Beyond just the data, we have to really be um, prepared to, to stand up and to really push and not be silent around the policy changes that we know we have. Hi, great talk. I'm Nathan Trouble. I'm a pediatrician and internist and an adjunct professor at the School of Pediatrics here, um, School of Medicine Department of Pediatrics. Uh, so often I kind of a lot of different discussions about systemic racism, and we often talk a lot about what we can do and professionalize to address it. Um, but I, I think you know, a lot doesn't get covered as much as the personal decisions we make that kind of uphold well, certain structures of racism and oppression, uh, in particular, you know, where we live, where we send our children to school, how highly segregated uh, our society is. And, and so I, I was wondering, since you guys talk about housing and its impacts, if you could kind of talk a little bit about some of those personal decisions and how we can all potentially think about addressing racism in that part of our lives as well. And you do said about our personal decisions about how we go about addressing racial inequities and so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you from, from my perspective. So um, I grew up in, in St. Paul and I still live in St. Paul and I live in Frogtown. How many people know about Frogtown? About, right? When sports, right? Right? But I'm, and, and I could really um, live anywhere. But I made that decision because the, the, the first reason I made the decision was that I was actually recruited because the um, 
uh, community development um, organization was actually recruiting middle income families to come back and, and live in the in, in the city. And I said, works for me. Let's let, let's do it. Um, raise my children there. Um, raise many of my nieces and nephews there. And um, I love it, and, and I'm proud of it. And I tell people that what was important to me was that my children were exposed to people that look like them, and also a rainbow of people, and so that they learn different cultures. And that they, I mean, my uh, grandchildren and my daughter and son-in-law, they would prefer to go to a Vietnamese restaurant and than, than anything. Uh, and so I, I think that that, would, that kind of personal decision is the kind of thing that um, pays off and you start to transform um, communities as well. Um, I would just add, I think it's a really important question, one I struggle with all the time, um, because I think we are um, trying, we're forced to make decisions, personal decisions about, you know, for our children, where we're going to live and where we're going to send them to school um, within a system and a structure that was never meant for uh, a child that looks like mine to actually thrive. Um, and so then, as a result, personally, um, I'm forced right, to have to make a decision that is best for my kid, which may not be the best thing for the broader community, right? And there's this, this push and pull all the time, and that goes back to these social determinants of health, right? So if if where we live didn't matter um, as much, right, then I could live anywhere I wanted and send my kid to a school that um, where she could be exposed to people of, of all sorts of <laughs> backgrounds, and we have a society that is not built in that way. Um, and until we uh, address that, you know, I think this, this conflict, you know, is going to sit there and, um, you know, we will continue to, to struggle with it. And about three more. Three or four more. Okay. Hi. I'm Tia Bastian. I'm the evaluator at Special Day Analyst. I have a question, sort of slash comment for Bruce about the trees that you put up um, and the roots um, that were about listening deeply and fostering trust and the way that the center does um, their work. And I just wonder if something should be added to that diagram that's like what kind of soil fosters that type of growth because we're talking a lot about like the systems and like what could something allow the Department of Health to start doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing things like, um, you know, there's a monetary investment in setting up the center to do this type of thing. Inclusive leadership, um, you know, humility, systems for continued learning and reflection. Because like, I want to plant a tree, too, but I can't just plot that anywhere. So I think we need to talk about the soil that's going to foster that tree to grow. So no pun intended, but it's like I planted you. And <laughs> because we have a report coming out in 2020 where we're, we're talking about this frame of what is a health equity ecosystem and what is required for there to be soil and trees and living organisms all connected with biodiversity and interdependence where there is nutrients and enough nutrients for everyone to thrive. Because as we come up on 20 years of our EHDI grants, we keep getting this question of, okay, so you've given out um, these like $100,000 grants to 20 orgs per year. How have they changed population health for the state? Which is, I see it like head shakes, an unfair question. Right? But that is a question that legislators are asking us. And so to counter that or to be proactive, we're putting out this report showing both the impact our grantees have had, which has been significant, and to say it's not enough to throw them in, into the water and say swim. We have to create the environment that fosters um, the thriving. So that, that is what we're hoping to do as well. And I should say that everything that in that tree came from community that we heard from, and it's not from us, it's from community. Hi, my name is Sophie Ali. I am a family physician. I've been in community medicine for 20 years, and I also a proud alumna of the School of Public Health. And um, this talk is racism and health, and I just feel like I need to point out the elephant in the room, which is sort of alluded to by the pediatrician colleague over here, that structural racism is alive and well in healthcare and in healthcare providers. And the problem is that people who go into healthcare mean well and want to help people. So the self-identification of the implicit bias is really hard. And if you happen to be a person of color speaking up in meetings about things that are going on, 
is not welcome. Um, so I'm just wondering about efforts that you've seen to address address implicit bias in healthcare providers. I, for one, feel like the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice needs to make it mandatory to have a full day training. We have all your licenses approved for anything in the state, mm -hmm. and the Academic Health Center needs to mandate classes in systemic racism. But I don't know. So thank you for your comment. Um, the first thing I would say is I think um, you know implicit bias has become a significant sort of buzzword in the healthcare and the public health community, um, and we've become, we've become comfortable talking about how unconscious or automatic biases right um, impact can have an impact in sort of the clinical encounter, and then we have to learn how to. Um, to combat that, but unfortunately, there actually is not any empirical evidence that shows that implicit bias training is effective. Um, we also need to understand that implicit bias training has to be um, fit within sort of an understanding of institutional, systemic, and structural uh, racism. And I think at the medical education level, so the stu um, you know, in medical schools, there's more movement in that space and discussions. Um, even here at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Brooke Cunningham and the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health is doing. Um, um, work in that space. Um, California just passed legislation, state level legislation, that is requiring that any of their perinatal um, care providers have complete quote unquote implicit bias training. Um, and if anyone's interested in having a discussion about that, let me know. I've been uh, deeply involved with that work. Um, so I think we are slowly getting there, but, in, but you're right, until it's mandated, until, until some sort of training is part, is embedded into systems for certification. Um, uh, you know, requirements for graduation from medical school for residency, and that is ongoing, right? This can't be just a one, one time, four hour, um, you know, training or lecture that, right, that we're checking off. This has to be embedded into every aspect uh, of, uh, of the work that we're doing as health providers, as public health professionals, uh, as medical students. I'll put in a plug for my course in school of public health for the students in the room. Um, 37 in the spring. <laughs> 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 I'll just add another resource. Um, you can take a look at uh, Innocent Technologies, mm -hmm. which is based in Minneapolis. Um, they started doing work in classrooms on innocent care, um, innocent classrooms, and how to treat any kids you're working with as innocent from the get go. And now they're piloting a program in, with healthcare called Innocent Care to train providers on how to do the same for your patients. And they're based here in Minneapolis. I just wanted to just, just jump in and say, um, I think the <laughs> underneath that need for implicit bias, which we have, is the need to name racism and discrimination as huge drivers of health and illness and disability. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the why we need implicit bias, I think it gets lost just by not naming that that's the why. Mm -hmm. um, right. yeah. The other part that I would say is that I think that Margaret Mee comes never to underestimate what a small group of people can do to change the world. So within our system at Hennepin Healthcare, which was like mired in historical trauma, and it was just, you know, we were, were very trauma organized, like people um, kind of in a scarcity mode fighting for church and work and whatnot. Um, it's, it's, a, it's hard to be innovative in that setting, but a small group of us, uh, and in from very different areas, we're interested in trauma-informed care. So it's sort of chaplaincy, security, nursing, peds, like all of these different people, and it was really like 10 people. It wasn't like a huge group, and just started meeting, started having conversations with leadership to talk about historical trauma and trauma-informed care, and initially the leadership, which were these white male surgeons, were like, I, I don't get it. They're like, trauma is a car accident, I don't really get it. And it really took, up, it took, I would say, years of those sorts of conversations and relationship building, and eventually they agreed at the highest level that the hospital would be a trauma-informed healthcare system. They um, allowed us to do historical trauma training with 600 staff. Um, it, it was the first time in Hennepin history that they had openly talked about racism as a staff, and it was powerful and painful and really just the beginning. So I would say, you know, there are there are people that are just like this young um, student here, just really wanting. Um, opportunities to connect with other people that care deeply and don't have it all figured out and don't know where to begin. Um, I think it's just, you know, kind of inviting people to come together just like, you know, once a week or once a, a time and you'll, it's amazing how many people are coming forward. So I would just start wherever you are. And I, I'm just going to say two quick things in, um, about uh, where healthcare is going in the trend. And one, I'm talking about value-based care. 
when, how we pay and reimburse for health care will force some of that to happen. So that it's no longer you get paid just because, you know, somebody came into your office and you provided X, Y, Z. It's about what was the outcome. Did they get better? Uh, one of the things that we stress as well is that you are a partner in the health care if your patient is really the driver. And having those kinds of conversations, we have a one of our psychologists that actually teaches the trauma-informed care, he has, and we're going to make it widely um, done through our clinic, is that after every session, he has his patients rate him. How did I do? Did I meet all of your needs? And that then changes that dynamic, because now that patient is like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, you didn't meet everything. <laughs> you, I, I, you know, you didn't make eye contact. So when those kinds of things change, people would, you know, you know, follow the money, follow the money. Hi, uh, my name is Trisha Sander. I'm an MPH nutrition student here. Um, and I guess something I've heard a lot from folks in public health is how they found like their people their ride or dies and you know how they're doing the work that they want to do. But I guess I'm wondering more so, um, how did you get there, right? I mean, unless in your perfect world you kind of got to jump into the work doing exactly what you wanted to do with people who think like you. Um, I guess I'm kind of wondering how did you navigate the space of uh, maybe being the only person in the room thinking of these perspectives or, you know, being the only person of color in the room and like how did you keep going to get to this point of doing the thing that you want to do? Um, because currently in academia, I know for me, I'm used to being the only person of color, usually the only black woman in the space. And that can be exhausting, of course, you know. Um, and I guess I was wondering, you know, how did you not only find your people but navigate the time when you maybe couldn't come in swinging <laughs> the way you can now and you kind of establish a bit more. I like your shirt, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, black are um, um, I think it's still a work in progress for me. Um, I, I'm i often still the only person in the room, right? But I mean, I'm certainly the only person in my department. Um, and I think, you know, along the way, so I'm still finding those folks, right? And a lot of them are, you know, are spread out over the country. So then I have to be intentional about, like, going to meetings and like traveling to go, um, you know, see my people. Um, and, you know, and for me, that's uh, really black scholars who are working in the maternal and infant um, health space. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's not a great, like, straightforward answer to your question because it shifts and changes all the time. Um, I think that uh, in many instances, it becomes clear sort of who you can trust and who you can, who you know has your back. Um, and they show up for you, and they uh, are the ones asking, uh, or not even asking, or just speaking up. So, it, so here's one of you know the folks who, if I'm sitting in a meeting and I'm like, okay, am I gonna have to be the one to bring up this, you know, whatever the issue is, usually related really to race. The person who is not black in that space that brings it up is someone that you know that's a signal to me like, okay, I've got someone who is. Thinking about these issues, right? And um, and so, and it's you know a lot of trial and error too. Yeah, I I would say so. My background is in public health. My my training is in psychology and social work, so I'm a social worker. Um, but in all my work, I've always looked for works jobs tied to justice and equity across intersections. Um, and I think it's important to remember that you have to find that thing that is your life's work, which for me was about equity and justice, and it took me into jobs so that your job and your career is not your life's work. And you have to make that distinction, or you'll end up in jobs where you're completely invested and burnt out, and the system is continuing to kill you, right? But you have to find the things where you thrive in and outside of work, where a job complements your life's work, but it is not your life's work. And I never thought I would work for a government agency, because I came from advocacy. But I, it was a job where they said they would pay me to talk about race every day, and I'm not the only one in the room saying that's racist. It's my white colleagues who are saying that. And if it weren't like that, I wouldn't be in the environment. I have one last. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah, and I work here at the School of Public Health. Um, my question, because I want to make you want something really easy, uh, is <laughs> we live in a cyber-hated country, right, state. Uh, my child goes 
to a school that's half black and half white. It's a Title I school. My question is, we are raising a lot of white children who are only in white environments. We're raising a lot of black children who wind up in black environments and are more successful that way. So we are always going to have an influx of well-meaning white people who want to do good. And my sort of example of that is my child's school does a partnership with Children's Theater. And this year, I can't remember if it's Blake or Brack, but in my mind, they're the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but they're coming in to mentor our kids as part of this partnership. And I couldn't touch on why that was so painful, and it was because it wasn't a Minneapolis public school allowing their students to get leadership. It was they're starting in high school to train those children to be well meaning interveners in the impoverished environment. It's hard to go motion. Um what do you see as the role of the K-12 area of, of childhood experience in helping us not have to solve the adult problem? Sorry. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. So that, uh, I, I do think that, uh, so I applaud you in that I think it's important, um, just like I shared that uh, I live in Frogtown and we did that for uh, very um, intentional about it because I wanted that my uh, children and my grandchildren had that multicultural um, experience. Um, I think also that I mean, we, we can challenge the K-12. I mean, it's not like that. That was something that you were keenly aware of. It's like, hmm, this stuff about this right here is going to create this um, in these uh, high schoolers that, oh, you're coming in to solve uh, the problems in the inner city, that kind of thing. And um, it's an opportunity to, to, to that school because it's something that I always used to say to many of my white colleagues that would say um, after a um, incident that would happen in a community, oh, what can I do? How can I help? And I said, you know what, go back to your community and make sure that you are raising children and community members that really get this and understand about racism and understand the impact that they have. I said because I don't need you to come over here because we get it. We know what's going on. I need you to make sure that you're aware of what's going on. And a lot of times, um, in those suburban all-white communities, it is not all peaches and cream, right? We know what's going on. We know that the high rate of the, the drug abuse and the suicides and all kinds of things. It's just that because of the uh, political uh, dynamic in the the money is covered up. It's not on display. It's really not. And case in point, you drive through a community in a black neighborhood, a lot of this is, is out in the open. You go through a white suburban, you're going like, oh, this is great. There's no crime here. But, right, open up the doors, somebody is beating the hell out of their wife, some kid is about ready to overdose, and there's stuff going on there. But it's not visible. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. It doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be an intervention there. Does that kind of sort of? Self <laughs> into like a box. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mean, I think it's an important question and an important point. Um, and I think it speaks to the narratives, right? The way that we've been socialized from the time we are infants and children to think about. Um, um, who we are, our place in society, and what our role is. And I think most people do want to be helpful and want to give back and want to be useful, um, but there has been very little critical analysis around sort of um, what that means and what that should look like, um, both you know as adults and as you know working professionals, but also as children. And so, um, you know, I think it's an important critique of, of what we are, you know, how we are preparing our kids, um, and what and also what we're exposing our our children too, and kind of what that story, or how we're reinforcing that that narrative and that socialization. And I don't know what the answer is, um, 
But I suspect that you were necessarily <laughs> looking for a, an answer. But I, I mean, it's an important, it's such an important um, question. I just want to thank our panelists and the audience today. I <laughs> If you go to our Center for Health Equity website, sign up on our lister. We have a grant coming out next week, a new RP, $750,000 for early childhood addressing health and racial equity. So get it out to your community partners. That's opening next week. And then we're hosting a Health Equity Summit in April 2020, an uh, innovation lab where we're going to be looking at how to dismantle institutional racism to address um, health outcomes. So uh, that's on our list too, if you want to sign up. Thank you so much.